You know, Owen. Yes, Troy. I have, uh, I just realized, um, I didn't tweet this. Well, that happens. I ought to do that. It's, you know, Thursday, which is, it's an important part of everybody's week. It sort of says, go ahead. Important part of this complete breakfast. That's exactly right. It sort of says Friday's almost here. Um, the week is near its end. But the day is just beginning. And that day is Thursday with Owen Casey Stevens. And I'm your disembodied pal, Troy. And I am furiously typing. Because Owen forgot. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I was literally going to write a tweet saying it was your fault. But it's all mine. It's okay. I can take the heat. Yeah, you know, that's the good thing about Thursdays is there's no heat. I mean, it's a lot of, a lot of heat, but there's no, like, you know, no burn. A lot of fire. <laughs> no blisters. Which is, as you know, my life's motto. All sizzle, no char. <laughs> that's right. I love it. All sizzle, no char. Um, You know, we're picking up some steam. I see some people have joined us. Hello. Welcome to Thursday. I'm going to presume that you can all hear us because I've got... Whoa! Well, well, well. That I don't know if you heard that, but that was loud in my ears. Nope, it was fine out here. You know, today's program is actually brought to you by the Fantasy Age a bestiary, as I've learned in my middle age, is how it's said. I've always thought it was bestiary. Why did I think it was bestiary, Owen? You think it was bestiary because it's full of beasts. Oh, yes, that's why. Yeah, yeah, I'll buy that. I I, I said bestiary for most of my life, but bestiary is, in fact, I mean, first of all, the spelling is very clearly bestiary. But it also is that's apparently, apparently correct. Well, I also want to say hello to Brian. Uh, Brian F. Irving is in the house. Mark Karen is here. Uh, Karen or Karen. Uh, RPG Alliance Convention. Hello, friends. Thank you for letting us know. Um, you know, I might as well just... Today's program is brought to you by Thursday. It sure is. You know, actually, um, this... I'm going to do this because this music is about ready to make me, you know... You know what I'm saying? Hey, look, it's you. It's Owen. Owen, you are the star of uh, this program, this Thursday with Owen Casey Stevens, which is why it's called that. And then I'm the disembodied Troy. And we hang out every Thursday, uh, very nearly. Um, and we talk <laughs> about... <laughs> we, we talk about, about hanging out every Thursday and sometimes we do it. We do. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, I would say most times. I'm going to give us more credit. Um, but I'll also say that it is one of my favorite parts of the week. We get to sit down and talk about fantasy age stuff. And today we're talking about building encounters. And did you know yep. that that was a fan request? Yeah. Someone said, yeah. yeah. Um, and I believe I even said as much in the, in the program write up. So, um, Congratulations to that individual whom I will be pinging. Hopefully um, you're in chat. Are you in chat? Gary Avengers here. Uh, you know, Gary's a pal. Um, let's see. Yeah, an awesome fan request. Exactly. Um, and I've got to remember who it was. It James? Do you remember who it was? Uh, I thought it was Jason Waltman, but... Oh, it's Jason Wallman. That's exactly who it was. Um, you know, uh, Jason, because we decided to uh, pick your topic, we're going to give you some kind of special prize. I don't know what it is yet, but it is going to be a surprise to all of us. Uh, but it'll be great, too. Um, Owen, uh, tell me about today. Uh, so we had been going through a lot of the, the kind of core books of Fantasy Age uh, and talking about how to use them. And that brought about me talking about how you could adapt pieces and parts and elements 
uh, for building an encounter. And then we had the very reasonable question, hey, can we talk about how you design an encounter? Because obviously, if you if you don't know how to uh, make an encounter, then you don't know how to borrow things and adapt them to make an encounter. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, I see Mark Cameron. Uh, I understand there's a chapter on how to create new monsters in the bestiary, but is there any plan by Green Running to make a second book? Uh, maybe. Uh, we're certainly not ruling it out. Monster books are extremely popular, uh, both with creators and with GMs. The one drawback they tend to have, uh, and I'm getting off topic here, but, you know, it's my show. So uh, the one drawback they have is that frequently they are bought more by GMs than players, and there are frequently more players than GMs. So the sales aren't always there, but they are amongst the most popular GM facing books amongst players. So they, they sell better than like adventures do. Which is why we're going to make one and we're going to charge $3 million for it. Well, then we just need the one, right? And we'll, yeah, we'll just play the it one. in gold. And... Yeah, well, you can loan it out if you want it, Mark. I mean, that would be a great Kickstarter, right? Funding level, $3 million. Reward level, $3 million. What's the reward? <laughs> you get the thing. <laughs> I like that. Uh, Mark says, uh, I really like the adventure hooks with each creature. Yep. Uh, uh, one of the really nice things about the, the Fantasy Age bestiary is that every creature has some suggestions on how you can use it. Um, so one of the first things that frequently people need when building an encounter is inspiration. Uh, being a GM uh, is sort of like having to play a game before you get to play the game, right? You've got to prepare an adventure for people to go through. And different GMs handle that different ways. Some people are very laissez-faire and they say, okay, where are you all going? Uh, I had a, a friend who was relatively famous for having a very sandbox world, meaning that he planned nothing out in advance. And he'd just say, okay, where are you guys going? And they'd be like, well, uh, we think we'd like to explain the, explore the mines of Moria. And he'd be like, great, give me 10 minutes. And he'd pull up some resources and throw something together for that. If you are good at off-the-cuff creation, that's great. Uh, if not, it can be a good idea to have some places you know you can go. The best year is a great example of that. So if people are like, hey, we're going to go heading off into the woods, and you can say, oh, I I was really sure you were all headed into the mines, and now you're headed into the woods. Uh, okay, well, <laughs> let me see what kind of things might be in the woods. Um, and the uh, there's a lot of specific notes uh, in the Campaign Builder's Guide that we went over about uh, building subgenres and epic campaigns and building locations, um, all of which, and there's chapter three is building encounters in, in the uh, campaign builder's guide. So if you sort of want our best overview, the, the 101 course, um, I recommend going and picking up that book and going to, to chapter two, uh, page 17 and reading through it. But there are some things that I have found very useful for building encounters for a specific group of players that I'm not sure I have ever expressed to people before. And the reason for that is I am often thinking about building encounters as a game designer, right? And as mm. a game designer, I need to build an encounter that some other GM can run for a group of players I've never met and have a good time. So I can't, for example, write an encounter and say, hey, you have to have water arcana to get through this encounter because I have no way of knowing if a group of players are going to have a water arcana available to them. But the point of view from a GM as opposed to a game designer tends to be very different. It tends to be, I've got this group of players I'm preparing for this game. What can I do to entertain them? So I frequently, as a GM, work backwards. And this is what I mean. I will pick something involving one of the players and then build an encounter around that and then go through the normal steps of building an encounter. Uh, so for example, and this doesn't have to be game mechanical, right? If one of the characters uh, has very clearly dedicated their character to the love of cheese. I mean, I, I, mm. I played a, a Tyriomancer at one point, which is literally a diviner who divines the future in the curds and the, the veining and, and the texture of cheese. That's, that's an oh. actual thing. Is it a um, real thing? Like that's a real that, yeah, that no, yeah, a... there are 8 million different weird ways you can try and divine things. If you look at, at historical uh divination and and, yeah, and different cultures that's, yeah. that's pretty solid. Cheese, cheese divination is absolutely a thing i think if it moves or smells or makes a noise someone has tried to divine out of it right oh 
you know, the, the ancient Greek had diviners who tried to divine the future from the movement of geese. Uh, oh. Right. So, but, so let's say you've got someone whose character is very much into cheese and that love of cheese is just a, a trait that they have picked for their character. It's doesn't, they're, they're not playing a cheese amancer. They, they, they don't have a specialization that gives them a plus two bonus to, to tests when they are near cheese. They've just played someone that likes cheese. Well, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't featured that at all in a campaign, you can say, okay, I've picked this character. I've picked this thing. He loves cheese. How can I have cheese be the focus of an encounter? And you can do, someone says, one of my players plays an orc rogue artist who has a love of cheese. Um, che a fromage. Uh, um, a cheese fromage. Is, I love it. Cheese is popular amongst gamers and game designers. Um, I would I would dare to say that cheese may be more popular than bacon amongst game designers. Anyway, uh, you can say sir. to yourself, how can I involve cheese in an encounter? And now you've got a starting point. And there are at least three totally different approaches you can take. Um, one is to say that cheese will be part of the plot. For example, you all are traveling along the road and you find a cheesemonger's cart that has been knocked over and all the cheese has been torn up uh, and there's no sign of the cheesemonger. Now, that is obviously the beginning of a, a bandit slash ambush style encounter. But because you have very specifically selected a cheesemonger and piles of cheese, you therefore have drawn the interest of and raised the suspicions of the cheese-focused character. And that can be great. Um, a suspicious player is often a player who will do half the work for you, right? Uh, a suspicious player will also often say things that you can use later. Um, another note, for inspiration whenever your players are talking listen and if they come up with a better idea than you have even if you're not fast enough on the draw to use it then uh write it down to use some version of it later right like if they find the spilled cheese cart one of the players says oh i wonder if someone was smuggling messages into this big militant town up ahead by putting them in a very unpopular brand of cheese so there's a smelly <laughs> nasty cheese that no one likes and that's what has all the messages in and all you were doing was, hey, some bandits hit this cheese cart. But you're like, wow, hiding messages and unpopular food is a great idea. Even if you don't change that encounter, you write down that idea. And then maybe in, in five game sessions, they come across, you know, the world's worst tasting loaf of bread. And it is only later that they discover that these terrible, terrible loaves of bread are being used to smuggle notes or even weapons and no one ever inspects them because the bread's terrible. It's got, it's hard and, and, and has no flavor. It's like cardboard. Um, so and Brian shares something oh, just real quick. A Brian shares something that is, uh, let's see if we can get the whole thing on here. That's great. So this is kind of what you're talking about a little bit that, mm -hmm. the, you know, characters love of cheese was used as, you know, an encounter with, you know, none other than the rat King. That's fun. I love that. Very awesome. Uh, yes, go on. Sorry. So uh, let's say that you don't want to just have cheese be part of the background. So you want to take a second tack. You want to say, I want to make cheese an actual important element of this encounter. Uh, and we have established previously that this character has made cheese and he's good with cheese. And I have, because it's not supposed to be important, I've given him a bonus to tests to recognize cheese. Um and so then you decide, well, instead, maybe identifying cheese will be an important clue in who a bad guy is. And then you think to like, you know, Sherlock Holmes is always famously identifying uh, this particular brand of tobacco or this mud is from this area. So you've got some criminal going around perpetrating crimes and so far no one's been able to catch them. And you have one of the players uh, make a test to the, the cheese loving one and you say and you get your cheese bonus that we've just thrown in for fun and it turns out there's some crumbs of a very expensive soft cheese from another area in the corner because you've decided that this criminal likes to savor the scene of the crime and eat his favorite cheese well if that cheese is incredibly expensive and hard to get and the players identify that they now have an option of going oh we can go see who imports this cheese and who's buying it and then we can find the bad guy uh, so that is a second tack you can take. The third is to just slap whatever you are looking at from a character onto a game stat encounter. So I've talked about reskinning things before. Uh, if we look at just the core rule book, right, um, the basic rule book, and we're going to look at its bestiary, and we're going to say, I, I'm just using this small list of monsters 
how can I make one of them cheese related? Right. Um, and, and it's, it's a silly thing, but it can work. And so you're flipping through and you're like, okay, I don't want cheese bandits. I don't want cheese demon soldiers. Uh, but here, here at the end, I find walking dead. Okay. Maybe instead of mummies that have been mummified with a fancy process and the brains removed from the nose and wrapped and everything, maybe we have here some people that were killed when their business was taken over by the mob, by them being pushed down and drowned in cheese. And then their bodies were snuck out of the city in big wheels of cheese so that the corpses wouldn't be found. And they have turned into cheese zombies. They are literally zombies with cheese shot through their body. And now I've got an idea for an encounter. It's a fight and it's a fight with zombies. But instead of moaning in the smell of rot, it's going to start with a sort of squelchy shuffling noise and this strong blue cheese smell. And that <laughs> takes what is otherwise an entirely normal, unusual, typical, everyone's seen it encounter with a few zombies and turned it into something the players will be talking about for weeks. It sounded like you were about to jump in, Troy. Uh, you know, I was laughing um, because I, I, I do, I really do respect that you, you have a, a certain class and a and a certain sort of you, you kind of raise the dialogue. I would have gone a different direction with the zombies and the odors and things like maybe more of a lactose intolerant kind of approach. But uh, I, you kept you kept it classy. Yeah, no, you're you're going more the Rob Schwalb route, which you know, <laughs> if, that's what, if that's what you and your group enjoy, go for it. Um, but that is all talking about doing a through line with just a trait. Another thing you can do is look at something like what are the characters good at? What are their skills are relevant to them? Uh, if you want to make an encounter that it is hard for most people to get through, but for some reason your group of players can, you can look at what abilities and focuses do they have and use those to build something that happens to be just perfect for them. And you don't want to do that too often or else the universe feels, you know, sort of fake uh, unless someone is specifically finding them, right? So let's say that you're specifically talking about, okay, I've got one character who's really good at, at animal handling and I have another character that is really good at swimming uh, and I've got another character that is really good with calligraphy. These are three different focuses. How can I make animal handling, swimming and calligraphy all work in an encounter? And then you just think about scenarios that could include those, kind of no matter how ridiculous it is. Like, it is well known that the only way to get into the ancient sunken city is by uh, figuring out the riddles of the dolphins. And the riddles of the dolphins have to be written down in wet sand. And there's going to be, you're going to have to swim to get to the area, and you're going to have to do animal handling to talk to the dolphins, and you're going to have to make a calligraphy check to perfectly duplicate what their riddle is in the wet sand. Now, that is a weird thing to just come across. But if the characters are famously good at these things, you then take things a step further and say, someone comes to you and says, hey, I need a group that can master animal handling, swimming, and calligraphy. You all have all those skills. I will pay you to come deal with this dolphin scenario. That is a particularly complicated version. You can do a simple version like, oh, look, this person is particularly good at traps. They've got dicks. They've got focus with traps. They've got a, a high dexterity ability score. Um, so I will put a trap in this encounter because that thing that is important to that player hasn't come up much. I look at the next encounter, another player. Oh, this one is really good at uh, intimidation. He's got a strength focus on intimidation, likes to intimidate people. So I will set up an encounter where the easiest way through, you know, they're not going to let you into the, the town. You don't want to start a fight. You really have to just browbeat them you can just go through and pick abilities. Oh, this person's really good at self-discipline. This person is really good uh, with, with bargaining. And that becomes the opening point of what you're trying to make this encounter. Because you've got an advantage over any game designer writing an encounter uh, in a pre-prepped adventure. Your advantage is that you have the knowledge of and access to the player's character sheets. And you can reason that anything they've spent a lot of resources in is something that they find fun and interesting and important to their character. So if someone has done everything they can possibly do to be a master of spears, 
um, then you can say, hey, I'm going to have an encounter where there is a hot young spear fighter coming along who's trying to defeat the 20 best spear fighters in the land. And he has heard that one of the other players, one of the characters is a great spear fighter. And then you can do this, you know, the, the gunslinger dueling bit, except it's someone calling you out because they want to have a spear fight with you. Um, you can also use that with, if you're trying to get players to go to an encounter, like, you know, here is where the legendary spear of King Arthur, which hand to God is named Ron. Here's the spear Ron, the spear <laughs> of King Arthur is up over the hill. And not only is then someone going, well, I'm focused in spears. I, I've taken a bunch of, of two-handed and pole weapon and spear fighting specializations and talents. Obviously, I'm going to go do that. Um, but those starting points can then lead you to other places in the rules. So that is the character-focused way to get inspiration. Uh, and I, I'm not saying you should do it all the time, and you definitely want to rotate what players you do it through. But it can be really helpful to the players if you look at their characters every time they level up, including when they make characters, and you write down the three things each character is best at. And when you are lacking any other idea for an encounter, look at your list and say, which of these things haven't I hit recently? And then when you do it, you make a little check by it. You know, okay, we've dealt with his spears. We've dealt with the, the fromage thing. Oh, I haven't done anything with any of the mage's focuses, and he's a master of water magic maybe I can have an encounter that takes place near a waterfall and all water spells are more effective or there are extra stunts or there are location stunts for, for water magic. Um, or he can apply spell stunts to his water arcana for one less here. And then you've got a starting point, right? You, I know it's going to be a fight because I want it to be stunts. I know it's going to be a waterfall. What will I fight at this waterfall? And you could, instead of a troll under a bridge, you put a troll under a waterfall, which are a series of 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 mercats that are going not meerkats mercats like mermen but cats that are going to come out and attack you or it's a water <laughs> weed, whatever um so those starting points most gms in my experience once they have an idea of what they want to do they can follow the rule through line of what do i need to know right hey i'm gonna have wet rocks uh that might be a hazard oh yeah there's an entire section on hazards in the core rule books i can look at that um, so you can look at the stats on a character. You can look at, uh, the interests of a character, which are often aligned, but they're not necessarily one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you can also look at what do the game rules support? What sub rules are there? What, what abilities are there that I haven't played with recently? Uh, for fantasy age in particular, there's this great advantage that there are these stunt tables and there are specifically combat stunts, magic stunts exploration stunts and role-playing stunts and most of what i've been talking about here has sounded like combat encounters but i did mention uh, having to intimidate someone at some point one of the things that you can do especially in fantasy age is say i want this set of stunts to be relevant i haven't done anything where role-playing stunts matter for a game session or two okay then you can look at the role-playing stunts and see what do those let you do? And then you build an encounter where that matters, right? Like uh, there's the two point stunt sway the crowd. Your interpersonal efforts are so effective. They spill over onto others in the area and you affect one additional person of your choice past the original target. So then you can say, well, if I'm going to have sway the crowd and swaying the crowd matters, obviously I need a role-playing encounter with a crowd. Okay. Maybe a hungry urchin has tried to steal some food or money from a rich jerk and the jerk has caught the urchin and is threatening to chop their hand off and there's a crowd, but the crowd has not yet decided whether they would rather get the urchin free because that seems too severe or if they would rather be entertained by the brutality of watching this jerk chop a kid's hand off. You then have the situation where swaying the crowd is important. And therefore, I've created a role-playing encounter. And then you just throw a few numbers together. You know, what are the tests? How many times do you have to change people's opinion? Uh, what are the, the relevant checks? And you can just go through the, the options of ability focuses and abilities and say, okay, what's going to be most important here is communication. Uh, so I don't care about in the communication focuses, probably not animal handling. I'll see if they get into bargaining. 
deception if they lie, disguise, but etiquette, investigation, persuasion, those are all definitely going to be relevant. And those are all places where if you do that and you got an extra success, that you could sway the crowd around. And you say, maybe if you sway the crowd four times, they will decide to side with you and the shouting will be loud enough that the jerk will let the urchin go. Oh, and um, where are you pulling this out? Are you are you, are you uh, referencing a, a specific? So uh, for the fantas- for the stunts, I'm specifically looking at role-playing stunts on the basic rule book, page 79, which has the in- exploration stunts and the role-playing stunts. So just yes. looking at that table, which has all of those stunts on it, can be a great nice. starting point. For the ability focuses, I'm currently looking at page 10 of the core rulebook, which has ability focuses, which just lists them all. Nice, Um, yeah. And that, I was going to say, that is the next place you can go for ideas with encounters, right? Um, And people don't have to have these focuses to try to make those ability checks. So just looking at it, uh, I notice off the top of my head that... Uh, we've got willpower focuses of courage, faith, morale, and self-discipline. Um, you could have a faith encounter, right? You find a a partially destroyed altar of one of the player's gods. It does not matter if that, that not player, one of the character's gods. Uh, it does not matter if that character has taken faith as a focus for willpower they have written on their character sheet that they worship a particular deity and if this is a temple of that deity they will presumably want to scrub it clean and make it a place that is appropriate for worship again and you can say okay make a willpower faith check and maybe if they don't have faith you just lower the dc but again you've just picked a game mechanical element and then you've built an encounter around it which is so much easier than coming up with a complicated idea and trying to write up mechanics. And as I've shown, you you can pick any two things, right? We need uh, intimidation and rowing. How am I going to have intimidation and rowing in one encounter? Well, maybe the players are going to get involved in a rowing race, and you can intimidate the other side. I have the two ability focuses already picked out. All I need now are a few numbers, and the, the game tells you what the base tests of something supposed to be easy or difficult or whatever. And then you just run it. That's great. You know, and I will real quick, I want to call out uh, uh, Jason, um, who, as everybody knows, is uh, is a world class bargler. Um, he, he's a bargler, you know, just I mean, I think he he's pretty much the the only bargler that I know. Um, but yeah. Jason, um, bargaining are... and not bargling. Oh, oh yeah yeah that's yeah he's he's a bargler though um but uh but i do love that and um uh, jason i wanted to say congrats we we uh, chose your topic because it was a good topic and everybody has been so excited about today's show um and so i want to encourage everybody to think about um you know what would you like going to wax poetic on i mean it gets into the zone and it is like watching a maestro um I, I love it uh so if you've got thoughts or ideas things throw it out into the chat and you can also um share uh, uh a note to let's play at greenronin.com but here's what i need everyone to do right now we've got wow a ton of people who are hanging out on facebook we've got people who are hanging out on youtube and then on twitch do me a favor subscribe on uh on our um youtube channel and give us a thumbs up uh you know ding that bell and do all that good stuff and then do the same on uh on our um video uh on facebook our our uh, facebook stream you know i think we get so engaged in the conversation that folks um forget to give us a thumbs up it really helps us get more um uh, uh reach and uh it makes us look real cool too and we want to be cool um so help yeah, us out you, by doing if those you things. think this is something that other people might enjoy liking and subscribing and sharing causes the log algorithms of the world to show it to other gamers so they've got a chance to stay exciting if it's something they'll enjoy yep yep uh, duke is here as well good to see you duke um uh let's see um i want to look to uh, mark says i did a wrestling contest in one of uh, of the taverns in freeport it was great fun <laughs> this is good yeah that's super fun that yeah you are just creating opportunities for people to do their thing um jason does mention or ask the question what about the encounter stunt um so you can if you want to as part of designing an encounter design stunts for that encounter 
Um, and if you want to make it a location-based stun, I was talking earlier about uh, possibly having water magic be easier at a mystic waterfall. Uh, you can go to uh, the layers book for Fantasy Age, and it talks about location stunts. Um, the campaign guide talks about some similar things, and you basically have two options. You can take an existing stunt and make it cheaper, or make it cheaper when it's used in a particular way. Like, you know, if everyone's fighting in a moving river, maybe you tell everyone, hey, the knockdown stunt for combat is just one stunt point here because you're all resisting this flow of water. Um, or you can say decide to create a brand new stunt that only applies to that encounter. So if you're fighting in the river, okay, it's easy to get knocked over, but also this is a river of loggers and there are logs flowing down the river and you can, for one stunt point, push someone in front of a log as it comes by so they are hit by it and take an attack. So you've now created one cheaper stunt, just knocked down, but it's cheaper, and one brand new stunt. And in my experience, players will play with those stunts, which helps make encounters different from each other. Um, there's sort of a, a famous joke uh, when you're talking about like World of Warcraft or some other massively multiplayer, multiplayer online role-playing games that half of the encounters are, hey, go kill 10 wolves and bring me their pelts. And it can get, it doesn't matter if you're killing 10 wolves or killing 10 bandits and, and bringing back their, their ears for the bounty or killing 10 fire elementals because each one has a tiny sliver of, of ruby inside them. Those missions all feel about the same. So one of the, the tricks of encounter design is to try and make an encounter that when played will feel different from I move, I attack, I prep, I heal, I cast an offensive spell. You don't want the same choices to always be the best choices. Now, the stunt system helps with that in Fantasy Age over some role-playing games because you might have a really good choice. Oh, but I got a stunt, and that makes this other choice better. But you can lean into that by creating new stunts or making stunts cheaper in specific encounters so that those encounters have yet an entirely different feel to them. Uh, you can also look at stunts to tell you what game rules you need. Um, if you've been looking at the stunts, and again, here I am on the core rulebook, page 79, and I'm looking at the exploration stunt list. Um, a lot of those stunts are specifically around time and resources. Uh, so a speedy search, for example, you complete your test in half the time it would otherwise take. Well, by reading that as a GM, I can tell that that only matters if there is a limited amount of time. So I can say, I'm going to create an encounter that will have searches, but it will be timed. And I will tell everyone, hey, you all are only going to get 10 minutes in this area. Perhaps you're in a, in a burning building and flames are coming down and you're trying to rescue, rescue ancient pieces of useful art. Then exploration stunts are relevant. And if someone gets stunt points on a check, you know, I'm searching around. I want to look what's going on. Oh, speedy search. You complete your test in half the time. So instead of searching one thing in this period of time, you can search two and you got two chances at rescuing art. You could also look one up from that efficient search. If resources of any kind are typically consumed in the course of a test, you only use half as much. So if we go to the burning building, we can say, hey, you all are running in there with one bucket of water. And every time you make a search check, you have to throw a bucket of water on it, and then you have to go back out. And if someone comes up, they say, hey, you've got speedy search. You can make two search checks, but you only have one bucket of water. Oh, both efficient search, you can make two searches with the one bucket. Or maybe you're covering two buckets. Or someone has been clever, and they said, can I hold up four buckets because I've got a big strength test? And you're like, yeah, make a might check. But you've created both time and resources that you might not have thought of if you just say, hey, this encounter is a burning building, and you're trying to save art. Or you're trying to save the the library of Alexandria because of all the spell books in it, or there's a diary in there that will explain how the, the queen of sigil swords can be defeated uh, by breaking one of the sigil swords over the back of a particular magic turtle who will then tell you how to defeat her. Uh, what, whatever it is, you look at the game rules and work backwards to the encounter. So I've got the exploration stunts. They tell me there are things, uh, like with a flourish, again, for exploration stunts, the manner of your success is impressive to those who are nearby to watch you. You have a plus one bonus to oppose tests against them until the time or venue changes. Well, that may not just happen to come up, 
But once you see that these are the exploration stunts, you can design your encounter with those elements. And if you tell people, hey, you're pulling things out, then they're arguing with you about what should be saved or not, you're going to have to make opposed tests every time you run out. Then the players will, I promise you, if they run roll stunt points, look at the exploration stunts and say, ooh, 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 with a flourish, with a flourish, I'll do this and get this bonus on this test. I love it. Hey, uh, I've got a couple things. Um, I'm going to go with Derek's question first, and then, Ren, you'll sure. be up next. But uh, Derek says, um, I still don't have a ton of experience with age gameplay, but if someone comes up with a neat idea relevant to the encounter, how feasible is turning that into uh, like an improv stunt for that encounter? It is entirely feasible if you and your group are the type of people that like to do that. And let me open with, that's a great question. Uh, that is actually a question that we have talked about at great length uh, in Green Ronin when we were looking at the uh, core rulebook, which we're still working on, which will be a, a new rulebook that will replace the basic rulebook, but still be the same game. One of the things we were talking about was how flexible should stunts be. And uh, one of the people in the company, one of the owners, had played a game where someone was running away, and one of the players was like, can I throw my ask axe at them and try to trip them? And her reaction was, well, if you make an attack roll and you get stunt points, I will charge you two stunt points for that. So you've got, you know, and so he made, you know, his two attacks, he had two axes with two attacks, he could do that that round, uh, managed to get stunt points on one, threw it, tripped them, something you can't normally do in the game, but for that moment, someone wanted to try something. So if you're the sort of group that likes to improv stuff, uh, if a player suggests something, you can even tell your players, hey, feel free to ask if you can do something that the rules don't normally allow for uh i had a game just last week where i had a player character me i i had a a pc my character happened to be wandering around with eight bear traps with 20 foot long chains and we were attacked by flying creatures that were 15 feet up and my character could not reach them uh with his scythe so he threw a bear trap having opened it up <laughs> uh holding the chain at the other end hoping that the bear trap would throw up hit them and be able to pull them back um, and I had to burn a, a resource like stunt points to even try that. As it happens, I did not roll well enough to pull that off. But rather than just saying yes or saying no, the GM took the option of saying that's a thing you can do, but only if you have the sort of special success uh, resource to spend on it. I love it. Hey, quick question, um, or not, not really a question, but more of an observation. One of the things that I think that people who are engaged in playing uh, tabletop role play games don't really realize is how much impact their ideas and um, and thoughts and sort of feedback really does influence things that happen in the future. Um, you know, especially if you're within earshot of a dev and you've got a solid idea, uh, you know, it's one of those things to, to share and to talk about as feedback for, you know, ways that you think that you would improve the uh, experience for, um, you know, for future folks. Yeah, I, I personally think there are some game developers who are great, great game developers, great game writers who do not play the games that they write and develop for. Um, and I am impressed as heck that they are capable of that because I literally can't. If I am not playing a game, at least periodically, I will forget important feel elements of that game. But also some of my greatest ideas come from where I'm playing a game and I'm like, oh, I'd really like to do this thing. I can't figure out how these rules let me do this thing. So I can either spend the time to figure it out and then I can just share it, uh, something like improv stunt feats, right? Or if it's an area where the game doesn't cover it and maybe it should, uh, I can look at, see if there are new rules or rule adaptations. Uh, on my blog today, uh, and this is for Starfinder, but it's an example of, of adapting things. Uh, I wrote on my blog today on kcstevens.com, in Starfinder, how to take the vehicle chase rules and use them for a battle of the bands, right? Ah. Because those are both cases where you've got skills and efforts that are trying to get to a certain level of success. So that was a case where I just take that that set of rules and I tweak it and now we can do something new with it. That came about because people were talking to me about doing Josie and the Pussycats and, and, and big bands in space type plot lines. I wouldn't have thought of it on my own. So when you get to play with game designers uh, or you've got a venue like this, where you're talking to us and you, you ask questions uh, that can give us a real feel for what is going on in the play of these game systems. It's one of the reasons why I said that we wanted to do the new Fantasy Age Core rulebook to express 
uh, our response to some emergent behavior, to lean into the things that work well, to patch the things that didn't work well, uh, to cover some options that people asked about. A lot of that came directly from feedback uh, from players and from developers and ownership in this case, playing with other people. Um, so I want to bring up the next uh, question from our friend, Ren. And, um, you know, because this is, I think, one of your strong suits, because you can titillate, engage in, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, bring out the inner TTRPG sort of uh, um, fan in everybody, regardless of how good they may be or how much time they may have spent. So let's talk about like mid to high level players. And, you know, they come with some experience. They come with some expectations. How do you keep those folks really engaged? So uh, there are some challenges that can come into play, and that depends a lot on game system. Fantasy Age sort of carefully does not change the scale of characters so that you're shattering the world the way some role-playing games do. Um, you know, we don't have people uh, summoning five Cyclops and casting a wish spell and having a 23% chance of their god taking direct notice. That's just not the power, even, even at high level, that's not the power level of Fantasy Age. Um, but it can be important that you let uh, mid to high level players with mid to high level characters experience that their characters are different now. Uh, and I will give you an example. If you had characters who are brand new to Fantasy Age and they've got first level characters uh, and they're going along and they find the tipped over cheese cart and it turns out that there are a couple of goblins that have been hitting anyone who doesn't have guards on this road between these two small towns. And they're just going to do it for a week or two and then about the time someone would pay to have guards, they're going to get out of there. And so the players hunt them down, you have to deal with these two goblins. And maybe you talk to them, maybe you buy them out, maybe you hire them, maybe you beat them up or kill them. But whatever it is, it's just two goblins. If a year of gameplay later, those characters are 10th level, you don't want to just have them run into a bigger cart with more cheese that was knocked over by two trolls. And they have the same chance of success of everything. Everything's just bigger. You don't want to do that because it feels like there's no growth for the characters. Now, that doesn't mean you should never just say, okay, this is a fight with a bigger, more dangerous thing, but you should present these things differently. Uh, for example, if what you really wanted was to recreate that kind of encounter, instead of them wandering by and they happen to find that these two trolls have set up shop here, you could have the players discover, oh, you want a new... Uh, flaming arrow that's that's what you want well those all come from this country over there and we can't get any goods from there haven't been able to from a decade because there are two horrendous monsters that guard the one pass between here and there and heroes have gone up and tried to defeat them but they're destroyed they they can smash small armies no one's been able to do anything about it and then you can have that same encounter it's two things that have been setting up a, a, a racket in a trade route but the players know this is different from just facing the goblins. The other thing you can do is take things that previously would have been just impossible for the players and present them as an option now. Hey, you defeated two goblins. Let's say you went ahead and killed them. It's 10 levels later. Uh, you all are wake up one morning, and it turns out those two goblins were important missionaries from an entire tribe of goblins, and they were trying to share their faith of banditry with you, and you killed them, and this whole tribe is up in arms that you have destroyed their holy emissaries, and 50 or 60 of them are showing up to try and burn you into the ground. When you are first level, you cannot possibly deal with 50 or 60 goblins. But they're still just goblins. They're minor threats. And now that you're 10th, you've got area effect spells and you've got a load more specializations and a load more talents and a lot more hit points. You can deal this now. So that is exactly the sort of encounter that was previously impossible that you can now engage in. Plus, you've ramped up the complication by a level. Early on, uh, both with people new to a game and with people new to their characters, I like to try and keep things pretty simple at first, right? If you're playing a spellcaster and you're playing a first level spellcaster, you're just not sure how likely am I to make the test to successfully cast the spell, how many encounters are we going to have a day, how many mana points do I need, magic points do I need to worry about spending? By the time that person's 10th level, and the same is true for all the classes and, and all builds, they're like, okay, I've got a good feel for what I can and can't do. I know what my resources are. I know what I'm good at. And you can say, okay, 
uh, our ranger is going to, or our rogue is going to run to the ceiling, the, the roof of the building, and they're going to shoot at people. Uh, our warrior is going to hold the front door. But our two mages, one of them is going to do crowd control, and the other one's going to take the time to try and put out the fire so the inn doesn't get burned to the ground because we know how to do these two or three things at once. And then maybe you throw in multiple kinds of encounter, again, because they're high level. And you say, hey, the, the building is burning to the ground. You can search it for people here in the inn to see if you can get them out. That's an exploration action and use the exploration stunts but that will be your action during the fight so you've got a broader range of things going on so that the players know that their characters are more competent that they make a bigger impact in the world and can handle situations that they couldn't handle earlier in their career and at the same time the players aren't having to look up uh how, how do i make get stun points again what what happens with doubles what are my focuses how, how do i make a perception test all of that is stuff they're used to. So you can lean into by adding things on top of what they've already mastered. Interesting. That's a great uh, answer. And I have a, actually a question for people who were in the chat. When you think about creating things, uh, you know, encounters for your um, uh, party, for your group, what are some innovative things that may not necessarily be an exponential sort of increase in difficulty, but something that's a little twist on, on uh, you know, uh, the standard issue sort of running uh, running a, a campaign for Fantasy Age. I'm really curious. I, I've heard some great ideas and we have some great conversations going on uh, about this kind of stuff and some really weird ones too, but that is par for the course here at, on Thursday. Um, so yeah, if you've got uh, interesting ideas on keeping, you know, uh, advanced players engaged and sort of introducing elements that are, you know, unexpected, but, uh, you know, we're not looking for something like we just made it punishing, uh, like, you know, something a little more, uh, you know, if you, if you've got something, please do share, I'd, I'd be interested in, uh, and in reading it and sharing with the world as well. Um, all right. So we're at what happened to the time it's two forty eight um, Pacific, of course, which means, uh, you know, we got a, roughly 15 or so minutes. Um, uh, make sure you queue up some of your questions. If you, uh, I think we could probably get one or two, uh, in, uh, let's see. Um, here's an interesting question from David body. Um, uh, what about creating stun points into pools and sp uh, spending the pools stun points on an environmental stunt? You can absolutely do that. If that's what you want to do. Um, there, there are, there are various options for stunt pools. Uh, and you can almost anything that you, the GM want to do to change the feel of an encounter is cool. As long as you are clear with how that works and what is in play with the players. Right. So if you're saying, Hey, uh, here's an environment, you all can change the environment. Every time you get stunt points, you can spend some on combat or you can bank them for environmental use later in a pool. Um, that's cool. As long as you explain those rules and how they work. So that the players aren't going, well, why would I ever bank them? I'm going to use them all now on combat. And later you're like, well, you guys didn't bank enough, so you can't stop the building from burning to the ground. Everyone dies. Um, there's a, there is a, in my opinion, now very uncommon mentality that used to be more common that a lot of people mock, and I think for good reason, about the GM who wants to gotcha the players. And so if the players don't ask exactly the right question, uh, he'll say, nope, you guys didn't ask. You, you never told me you were searching behind the curtain and therefore that's where the atomic bomb was and even though you made search checks that was for everything else and the entire city blows up um i don't think that's fun for anyone right if i'm wrong if you and your group have a good time with that feel free i, I i'm not here to tell you how to have fun but in my experience that isn't fun so unless you're aware that you've got a weird outlier group who has a good time with that Anytime you are altering the rules, making changes to them, just be clear about it. And and if possible, write these things down and either send people an email or, or do them a handout. Uh, speaking of writing things down, the other thing I want to talk to for about briefly for encounters um, is I don't write out my encounters long form like they were in an adventure, right? Like I don't need read aloud text and I don't need to number it for A or whatever. But when I'm creating encounters to run people through, I do like to note down a few facts about them so that I am thinking about them. Um, one is, how do I expect this encounter to start? Uh, and that may be a sentence, right? The players come upon this in the road. 
Um, and then if the players don't take the road, I know that I'm going to have to move this or they're not there, but I've thought about it. Uh, but it could also be, right, someone comes and hires the players or someone hunts down to assassinate the players or the players hear the screaming of the goblin attack on the cheesemonger around the corner. <coughs> Those are all elements different from what is the encounter, but are relevant to the play experience. How do the players encounter it? What senses are relevant? Do they hear it first? Do they smell it first? Um, and I think smell is underrated. Uh, it may not make sense necessarily for cheesemonger attacks, although if it was a really smelly cheese, I could easily say, you know, you smell the strong smell of old feet, sweat socks, and uh, mold, and that turns out to be an expensive cheese that's been broken open. Um, but also, like, you know, if there's a, a burning building, people may smell that before they see it. They may see a glow of crimson in the background before they know what's going on. Just think about what senses people will be using to interact with. But also remember, uh, unless you've got, you know, computer, uh, computer graphic skills I lack, your description is how the players will interact with the encounter. So make a note to yourself of what's important. If... There are five barrels in here, and you know that one of the barrels happens to have uh, gunpowder in it instead of rice. You don't have to tell them, hey, there's a, gun, a barrel of gunpowder, but you do have to mention there are five barrels in here. One of them is on fire. Okay, uh -huh. you've now given them that information, and they can decide. whether. And you could even go, hey, if they make perception checks and they're high enough, one of them will notice that four of the barrels are marked with rice and one of them is smaller, has more iron bands around it and doesn't say it's rice. And then you've given the players the information to go, oh, that barrel's different and they can decide whether or not to do something about that. So, um, you know, real quickly, I'm, I'm, uh, I agree 100% and I think it's an important thing that we kind of talk about. Um, uh, I think we bring it up nearly every uh, Thursday and that's just the notion of, don't let your plans get in the way of fun for yeah. players. You know, don't that that gotcha stuff is um, is rarely does it mean a lot of fun and uh, and it it ends up just sort of people I think um, uh, losing interest and losing steam. Yeah, the, um, the only gotchas, in my opinion, that are ever fun are gotchas where after the fact the players and 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 the characters even go, I should have thought of that. Right. Um, right. Right. If, if you have a logical, you know, the, you, you have told the players that there's a person going around killing people by uh, poisoning wax in their candles. And then the players get a note that has a big wax seal on it and someone breaks it open with their bare hands and they've been poisoned. They will go, oh, oh, wax. You said wax I 97 did, yeah. times. I should have thought about that. <laughs> and then don't have them just foam up at the mouth and keel over dead, right? Have them make a, a constitution test of some kind. See how they're doing. There's some great mentions here. Um, I, I really love this. Um, yeah. The, the idea of like really for your for the people around your table setting a, 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 a psychological moment that helps them m remove themselves from the concern or the worry on another thing so they can maybe get into it a, a little more and enjoy it. I think that's really smart. Um, I really like, yeah, Jahan says, uh, this is great. Um, I, I love to of just like looking at this is uh, basically we're talking about, um, you know, uh, the Expanse RPG. Yeah. And uh, the notion of like looking at a ship from the outside in and how to help is really that opens up just a myriad of like you're, then you're talking about like ducks and, you know, like uh, I'm actual space ducks, um, you know, they're flying around out there, uh, you know, but just a really, really very interesting uh, way to um, uh, to kind of approach that stuff. Let's see here. Um and that's that is another source of inspiration that with the last five minutes we should at least touch on super briefly. Uh, yes, if there is anything cool you have ever seen in a television show or a movie, uh, an anime, read in a book, whatever, some cool moment or scene or event or problem, um, you can think to yourself, How do I do that in an encounter? and that is tougher than starting with the rules and working backwards. That is the, the concept forward method. And it's what most people use. But once you're a pretty good master of the rules, I remember seeing one of the G.I. Joe movies, not the most recent one, but a previous one, that has a fight on the side of a cliff with ninjas dangling from climbing ropes, having to run back and forth and attacking each other or attacking each other's ropes and thinking, 
that was worth the price of admission no matter how bad the rest of this movie might or might not be that was cool so how do i do that how do i set up an encounter where i'm saying okay you guys can you know it's one stunt point to try and cut a rope if you're adjacent to someone it's that shift ability to shift a little further knocking someone prone's a little different when they're on a rope on the side of a cliff and that is a way that you can again shake things up so that things are different you were just talking about having to help someone from outside and i was picturing uh going to fantasy instead of instead of the expanse saying okay you've got two sailing ships you and your your all the players are on one and you've got some allies on another one there's a big storm the ships are you know 50 60 feet apart you all can't get over there and you see your allies being attacked on the other ship all right now what are you going to do it's a fight do you have a bow you can shoot at them do you have spells with that range otherwise you are yelling at people, look out, they're coming around, but your ship isn't being attacked. This has suddenly become a fight encounter where you are trying to help your allies overcome the fight. That is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've gotten a note in the places where we get notes, and um, I see that we've got something to share. Uh, I think, uh -huh. yeah, I can't wait. Um, I'm, I am, uh, I'm just grabbing it now in the waning moments of the show um a uh, quick question um for ren ren um you uh have an age podcast if you're still in here would you do me a favor and share the link to that in chat so that i can uh, amplify um i i have listened to a couple uh a couple three or four or maybe more but they're very entertaining a lot of fun um, and so while I do that, Owen, do you want to kind of put a bow on it? Yeah. Um, when designing an encounter, uh, you want to look at how's it going to start? How do the players interact with it? What are their victory conditions? What are their failing conditions? And what are other complications? Um, and you can walk through that process and find the rules to answer all of it. And sometimes the victory conditions are simple. People tried to kill you. You're not dead. That's victory. Um, but you can also look at questions like, what rewards do you get? Did these people have treasure on them? Um, if you use something special against players, the players frequently want to get it. Now, that doesn't mean you always have to give it to them. But, you know, if they are fighting the assassin who is killing people with poisoned wax and you break into his candle shop and take him down, maybe they don't learn how to make the poison wax. But if there's a little poison wax there, you'd better have rules for how they can or cannot use it. And then that becomes part of their reward. You've got poison wax. Here's what you can do with it. Uh, and read, read the reactions of the room to certain things, right? Like if you were going to have, uh, this is a fight with 12 spiders that are made out of severed fingers that have been sewn together. And you describe one of those things scuttling out of the darkness. And one of your players turns green, gets up and walks away. <coughs> maybe the other 19 of those things just don't need to show up on the other Why? hand right. if everyone goes ew and then they talk about how much they're going to love stomping it then you've got a hit so just your your players are your best gauge for what your players will enjoy and keep track you can even ask them questions you know if you guys have comments or questions i it is sometimes like pulling teeth to get your players to tell you what you do and don't like but uh, you're more likely to get that information if you ask, and you're even more likely, in my experience, if you ask for something like, hey, I'm going to send out an email to each of you individually so that people can give feedback. So if someone's feedback is, well, I don't like fights because uh, Thrud the Barbarus always destroys everything before we move, then Thrud. you know that everyone else isn't having as much fun, and they would maybe like a fight that has enough different things going on that Thrud can't get rid of everything. Absolutely. Um, hey, Mark, thank you for your for your kind words. Truly, truly appreciated. And I got to say, Stan, thank you for your beautiful artwork. This and so is... the party stood on the shores of the stinking bog of blue cheese. We wield the sword of celery and the amulet of iron stomachs and a whole bucket of chicken wings. A whole bucket of chicken wings. And I believe that the person in the back with the chicken wings bucket is probably the cheese burglar. That is probably the cheese burglar. Yeah, and the master person in front is, is clearly uh, a master of celery celerity. <laughs> Hooray. Um, hey, folks, what a great uh program today truly enjoyed um have listening to owen share his uh deep knowledge and understanding of how this stuff 
works best or, or can work for you. Um, it is definitely um, inspiring for me. I love it dearly. If you've got ideas, questions, comments, um, thoughts, uh, compliments, um, you know, maybe you got a drawing you want to share, um, you know, do that by sending a note to let's play at green Ronin dot com and uh oh real quick before i forget you know stan is um our you know stan he does so many different uh i we're, we should do something we should figure out a way to kind of compile all of these and let some folks um uh have them they're really they're so fun and he's been doing it for both this program as well as uh mutants and masterminds monday um but um uh, oh and you know off the top because he you he's he's along with you a rouge genius right is that is that what it is yes stan and i are both part of rogue genius games rogue genius exactly and then um uh you'll find stan online under stan x yeah pretty much everywhere pretty much everywhere. Um, super, super fun um, discussion today. Uh, thanks everybody for your questions. And, um, you know, we're, yeah, we're two minutes over time. See, you get, that's the kind of thing we do here. We deliver two or three extra minutes of content just to say, thank you so much. Um, Owen, always a delight and a pleasure. We'll be back next Thursday. Do we want to tip our hand as far as like what we may be talking about and we want to keep it kind of fresh and we want if, to wait for if some someone ideas. doesn't come up with a better idea i will i will threaten to fill a full hour with why trying to do comedy games is a bad idea oh yeah absolutely yeah that seems a so, real so to be spared from that send a better idea to let's play at greedrunning.com absolutely yeah um all right friends thank you so much have a great rest of your week Put those masks on, get those vaccinations, and uh, hang out with us uh, this coming Monday, 2 p.m. Pacific, on all these places. We just sort of change up the set and the faces a bit. Um, I'm your disembodied voice, Troy, and um, it's been a blast. We will see you very soon. Bye-bye. Bye, folks.